my name is Jim Moorhart, and I'm the Deputy Administrator at NASA. On November 2nd of 2000, the Expedition 1 crew of Commander William Shepard, Sergei Krikalov, and Yuri Gudzinko arrived at the International Space Station. Since that day, we've had a continuous human presence of astronauts living and working aboard the world's only orbiting laboratory. The International Space Station is one of the most ambitious international collaborations ever attempted and is a convergence of science, technology, and human innovation that provides humanity a one-of-a-kind proving ground for Artemis as we go forward to the moon and then on to Mars. It's a demonstration platform for new technologies and a research laboratory for breakthroughs not possible on Earth. It represents the most complex space exploration program ever undertaken. And in the two decades that humans have inhabited the space station, we've used the unique orbiting laboratory to build our understanding of how humans can safely live in microgravity. We've made groundbreaking advancements in medicine. And we've tested technologies that will help us travel farther into space. At the same time, we've gained new insights into our home planet on Earth, and we've stimulated an emerging low Earth orbit economy. On behalf of NASA, congratulations to the International Space Station program and all of our international partners on this historic milestone. We look forward to what the next 20 years has in store. Hi, I'm Jean Meserve, and it's my pleasure to host a conversation that really is life and world changing. Today, I am joined on the program by the five primary partners of the International Space Station. Uh, let me introduce them now. Joel Montalbano of NASA, Frank DeWin of the European Space Agency, Luke Dubay of the Canadian Space Agency, Junichi Sakai of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, and Sergei Krikalev of, of Roscosmos with the Russian Federation. Welcome to all of you. Great to have you with us. And a special thank you to NASA for their assistance in assembling these leaders and to the Space Foundation Space Symposium 365 platform. And now, let's go. Um, Joel Montalbano, let me start with you. A lot of relationships don't work for 20 years, but this one has. Can you explain why this relationship is still going on and successfully? Well, excellent question and, and, and hold everyone and, and thank you for getting together today. You know, to me it works because we help each other, we learn from each other and, and we cooperate from each other. You know, throughout the 20 plus years of the International Space Station, whenever we've had a challenge, there's another partner that's always ready to step up and help wherever they can. Across the 20 plus years that we've seen operations of the International Space Station, you know, we've had those opportunities and every single time it, a partner has reached out to another partner when they were in need. And to me, that has been the biggest success of the International Space Station. Uh, Sergey Krikalev, do you want to weigh in on why this has been successful? Um, Joel already mentioned it, that um, this probably was successful for the last 20 years because it really started earlier than uh, 20 years ago. Uh, we started our first joint mission in 1975, uh, Apollo-Soyuz mission. Uh, we started our joint flights on shuttle and on Mir station uh, in the beginning of the uh, 90s. So in middle of 90s. Uh, so I think uh, the main reason why it works after that was because we have a really strong desire to do this. And this was the first part. And second part is that we have uh, very good professionals who was doing this because uh, good professionals had uh, really a big desire to, to be successful. We were successful for these 20 years. There are, as you all know, skeptics on earth who are asking, why are we spending this much money on space exploration? Mr. DeWin, can you tell us what value the space station has brought to people on Earth? Well, one of the biggest values, of course, is the cooperation itself. And you, you see around the world, it's not always, always so easy for big nations to work together. 
And this partnership has shown that if you have a common goal, if you want to work together, that you can achieve great things. And I think the example that it sets in that area is tremendous. But it has also brought very specific results. For example, ESA has done the experiment airway monitoring, where we study the lung functions of astronauts on board of the space station. Well, the results of that research have led to new technologies, new tests that can be used on asthma patients. And as a result of that, 300,000 patients have been tested. Uh, 36 million tests have been performed, and those patients have received specific medication for their disease. So it had a direct impact on their quality of life. Another example is, for example, the Melfi freezer uh, that we have on board of the International Space Station. It freezes our samples up to minus 80 degrees. Well, the technology that is used to maintain those kind of temperatures on board of the International Space Station is now used on big ships that transport gas. And this gas that normally boils off can be recycled. And due to that, we are recycling per year 100,000 tons of CO2 carbon emissions, meaning that it has a direct impact on fighting climate change. These are only two examples, but I know that our partners across the board have many more, have thousands of examples, how research innovation on the International Space Station has directly impacted the life of the citizens around the planet. You know, I'll say a, a couple things. You know, on the, you know, Frank mentioned the uh, the freezers we have on board and, and the minus 80 degree freezers. You know, we because of the the assets we have on the International Space Station and the the need for us to transport a, across the globe, we have reached out to help these drug companies that are about to start distributing the COVID-19 uh, vaccine and using our experience and offering up. This, this experience that we have globally to help this global pandemic. So to me, it's just one one of the many examples where we can capitalize on the International Space Station and what we've learned over these 20 plus years to help others and, and to benefit humans on Earth. Political winds blow, leadership changes. Um, Joel Montalbano, let me start with you on how you think these sorts of changes impact the International Space Station. You know, over the 20 plus years, we've had leadership changes uh, in all our agencies and, and, and the governments associated with them. And, you know, throughout that, the, the standard that's been cooperation, and we've been able to cooperate while meeting the different national priorities of the different agencies. And, and to me, the, the benefit of the International Space Station is we work uh, on a physics base, and physics is the same across the globe. So regardless, of any political change and leadership change, we're able to manage and operate the International Space Station. We're able to communicate because we're communicating in a, in a physics type method. We're able to operate and stay below any political type challenges, but we still are able to meet each agency's national goals. And so to me, that's again, another benefit of the International Space Station. And I'll open it up to any of my other colleagues if, if they wanna to add to that. Does anybody weigh in on that, on the uh, the changes in political leadership? Okay. Well, your agencies have worked together for two decades now, amazingly. Um, what are some of the things that you are able to do now that you could not do 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago? Mr. Dubay, why don't you go ahead with that one? So in our case, you know, our original uh, operation concept for the Canada Antoon Dexter was based on, on how the shuttle arm was operated with astronaut driving at every step. But what we do now looks nothing like that. CSC flight control room, which holds the uh, CSC flight controller, is now used a lot. The development of our ground segment is a big part of the uh, ground. Completely controlling the robots from the ground is now most of the uh, way we operate. So we work also with the American and the Japanese partner. We also added the capability to capture free flying cargo vehicle. So since uh, 2009, we have done 43 free flyer captures. We also have unexpectedly become a key provider for robotic services to external payload. So as a result, the demand of our robotics has gone up and up. 
So we have started also developing autonomous control on our ISS robots. So this will become the basis for how we design and operate on our future systems. Mr. Sakai, do you want to weigh in on this question of what you can do now that you couldn't do 10 or 15 years ago? Yeah, uh, we are able to uh, proceed a variety of utilization that were not originally expected due to the great efforts of uh, engineers and uh, researchers on the ISS. For example, there is a research in space medicine that will be useful for human, future human exploration and the private sector is act actively utilizing the ISS. We are also trying commercial components in ISS the success of Crew Dragon is also an epoch-making event. If I may appeal to you, uh, the Japanese experimental module Kibo has both a robotic airlock and a robotic arm to conduct CubeSat deployment and uh, material exposure experiments. There was developed by an engineer's idea after Kibo became operational. We have learned that assets having expandably uh, expandability fosters the utilization and future needs. I also believe that one of the achievements is that ISS international partners have been also to discuss and con consider the gateway, the next human space station based on the ISS co cooperative experiments of, uh, of the ISS program. Has the International space, change, uh, space Station changed your countries and your country's aspirations in space? This is something I would like all of you to respond to, but Mr. Krikalev, why don't we start with you? Has it changed the outlook? Um, in the beginning, of course, uh, although we have experience of uh, international cooperation on previous stages, but still was a pretty big concern uh, how well we can uh, work together, uh, what is going to be the result of our work and uh, how we will move forward together. Now we know that um, this uh, partnership is working really well and uh, now we are looking at the station not only as an uh, platform for uh, current exploration, but also as a platform for future exploration. We use uh, space station as a test bed for uh, new technology, for new uh, experiments that uh, result of this experiment we expect will be useful for future space exploration uh, beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, Mr. Dwin, do you want to weigh into this? Obviously, uh, countries plural in your case. Um, has the ISS changed things uh, in terms of um, space aspirations in Europe? Uh, absolutely, it has changed a lot. Uh, I'm coming from a small country myself, Belgium, uh, but nevertheless, I was able to fly to space twice. Without an international cooperation uh, like the International Space Station, this would, of course, not have been possible. And today we see we are actually starting a new astronaut selection in Europe in the next uh, months. We see that a lot of uh, countries have the aspiration to have their citizens flying to space. And uh, I'm sure that in the future, every European citizen can, can have these dreams. And this is, of course, relating directly to young people who have to invest in STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering and math. Uh, skills that we will need to build further our society in, in the future. Uh, but of course, it's not only linked to human spaceflight and to what we do on board of the International Space Station. Uh, there are so many other domains in space, uh, uh, navigation, Earth observation, telecommunications, where we will need a lot of people. And the fact that we can work in cooperation, that there is a visible element that people can see in the sky every night and say, my citizens, they are flying there, they are working there for the benefit of humankind has uh, dramatically changed uh, the way that Europeans look to, to space. Uh, Luc Dubay, how about your, what are your, your thoughts? Yeah, so our contribution, the Canadian arm has allowed Canada to become a world leader in space robotics. It's also gave us the access to a big laboratory for science and allowed Canada to have its astronauts fly long duration mission and international cooperation. It's also helped promoting the space in Canada and was key for the development of such in the industries and the academia. So it's inspired future generations in science and technology education. 
So it's a dream to come true for many Canadians. So we are very proud to contribute to such an important research opportunities. It is largely thanks to the ISS that the space community in Canada are now setting their sight on destinations like the Moon and Mars. So for 20 years, the ISS has been a vital test uh, bed for that enables us to prepare to explore deeper into space. So the Canadian Space Agency is very proud to play a big role in this endeavor. Joel Montalbano, your thoughts? You know, as, as you heard from Sergey and Frank and, and Luke, this space station has inspired a, a generation that is going to take us from low Earth orbit where we are today to return to the moon and then eventually to Mars. And, and we're using the experiences we have on the International Space Station. You know, going back to your last question, you talked about things have changed over the last 10 or, or 15 years. And when we first started this project, we each of the agencies had had really individual, a lot of individual projects. And what we've learned over time is if we work together and we cooperate and we combine assets and combine resources, we can do much more with the International Space Station. And, and that, that, um, that learning that we've done in the International Space Station has spilled over outside of just human spaceflight. In the, uh, in the science mission directorates that we cooperate internationally across the different agencies, we've taken the lessons learned from Space Station and we've used that to cooperate in those areas as well, that they based it on what we did on the International Space Station. So to me, just it's, it's been pretty cool. It's been cool to watch and it's been uh, just a, an awesome adventure so far. And if I could just follow up on that with you, um, in the current uh, world of budgetary constraints, is this kind of international cooperation necessary in space, simply from a financial point of view? It, it's mandatory in my mind. Um, you know, we've learned a long time ago that any single agency does not have the resources to do everything they, they want to do. And but when you combine, you put all these agencies together, we can accomplish so much more. And we have been. And the cool thing is we, we've demonstrated we don't, we don't just talk about it. We do it. And, and that's one of the best things about the International Space Station. I'm a little biased as the as you know, the NASA program manager. But I can tell you the, the people we're talking to today, I, I know would would sign up right behind me and agree. Uh, Mr. Sakai, we didn't get your thoughts on that initial question of how the ISS has changed your country and its aspirations in space. Oh, well, um, I guess I, the ISS program and its accomplishment has changed the LEO utilization easier than previous. It is not only allowed for some special person, but for everyone having what he wants to something, wants to try something in LEO. ISS accomplishment in many different areas, uh, for example, basic science, scientific research, uh, practical research leading to industrial industrialization, education of use of the next generations, international cooperation, etc. And JAXA as a only ISS participant in Asia provides opportunities for Asian countries to utilize the Kibo while building cooperation in the space field and promoting the significance of space experiments for each country. Uh, space is becoming more and more of a commercial enterprise, and I'm wondering how that's going to change uh, the ISS and potentially your partnership with one another. Joel Montalbana, you want to handle that first? All right. You know, so the first 10 years of, of Space Station were dedicated really to assembly. And then after assembly, we moved into a utilization research technology development where we're actually optimizing the use of the International Space Station. And then in these last, say, five or six years, we've been developing this, this commercial market in the U.S. And, and working with our partners to understand, you know, what it means to them and, and how we could help and how we can utilize the great space station we have. You know, in, in our mind, we've, um, we've been able to optimize with these commercial partners the use of the International Space Station. This weekend, we had the 100th uh, launch of the Falcon 9 rocket. And, you know, because of, we've helped develop that rocket, we've helped develop the Antares rocket for Northrop Grumman. And we've taken those activities as well as other activities and we brought 
items to the International Space Station. We open doors to the International Space Station for additional research and utilization technology development on board. And now we've opened these opportunities to commercial and, and it's not just NASA. Russia has done it, Canada has done it, you know, ESA has done it, JAXA has done it. We've all, you know, we're all starting in different places, but we're all moving and trying to optimize the, the use of commercialization and use this great resource that we have on board the International Space Station. Uh, Sergey Krikalev, you want to weigh in on that commercialization question? I can just add uh, what uh, Joel said that we really started from uh, some simple things like uh, we were flying tourists or uh, flight participants, uh, as we call them, uh, to space, and it was only one side of uh, commercialization. Uh, but now we see much more opportunities, such as uh, commercial experiments, and we know that some uh, some companies need some data uh, using the space environment, and we can use it. Uh, space station can be used to provide this data. So. Uh, the variety of uh, commercial application is much bigger than it was uh, a while ago. Uh, Frank DeWin, uh, from the European perspective, any downside to the commercialization or is this all a big plus? Well, the main is a big plus, of course, and again, it shows very clearly the agility of the partnership huh? because uh, uh, we have done so many new things with this uh, partnership uh, under this uh, agreement that was signed uh, now probably 25 years ago and that we have been able to adapt to the new environment and to the new world. Uh, of course, it also puts some strains on the, on the system because uh, the commercial companies, they want their data quicker, they want better access, they want easier access. So it also strains on our side the, the way that we operate. We need to completely uh, continuously rethink what we can do, how we can better now service a customer, uh, another customer, because initially our customers were only the scientists and they were used to work with us. Now we have to get used to work with other entities that have other drivers. So it's not always easy, but it shows for the agility of the partnership that again, not one of the agencies apart is, is able to do that, but through the cooperation, through exchanging experiences, how we do that, we are able to manage this, uh, this great new endeavor. And, at the end, of course, the aim is to build an economy in low Earth orbit. Uh, the aim is not that we as agencies, we continue to operate and, and to fly and, and, and to build everything in low Earth orbit, but that there is a real economy and we are just one of the users of the systems that will be there. And then we can focus, as was said already by uh, a number of our guests, uh, we can focus on exploration, the gateway going to the surface of the moon and eventually to Mars. This is where uh, we should have to shift our focus of the agencies in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, could I just follow up a moment and ask you about the strains that the commercial um, enterprises are putting on the system? Can you be specific about what you're talking about? Well, of course, if you have a commercial company that says, I want to do my research on board of the space station, they want to have, of course, a guarantee that they can fly. They want to have a return on investment. That's uh, everything that is there about the commercial companies. So how do we manage this at, as agencies? How do we put the priorities right with our member states, especially in ESA, because they fund the national science? How do we manage all these different inputs that we are getting, these different requirements that we are getting? And this is something that we need to learn. Uh, we are not there yet. We are not fully... 100% proficient yet, but I'm sure that we will get there over time. Uh, looking back on the challenges of designing and also building the space station, I'm one day wondering, Sergey Sergey Krikalov, um, what advice you might have for future projects that are this complex? Um, I think uh, what we experienced from very beginning that on top of uh, regular work relationship. We start to build a personal relationship inside the program. And I think this is very important because we, in this way, we can trust to each other. We know each other better. And I think uh, from my point of view, at least, it's one of the big advantages we have uh, through this program because now I have friends in Europe, in European Space Agency, in States, in Canada, in Japan. And uh, with some people, we work closer together in space. With some people, we were working uh, together here on the ground and mission control. Uh, but I think this is probably one of the 
reason why our program was successful because we uh, start to build uh, trust to each other and I think it's based on a personal relationship and I treasure this as a, as a part of my life experience. And in terms of the challenges of designing and building, what did you learn? What would you do differently if you were to do it again, Mr. Krikalev? Um, I think we, we have different uh, learning on different stages because sometimes uh, we try to do things standard and it has some advantages. But also uh, the live show that uh, things still different. We have one voltage on Russian segment. We have a different voltage on uh, US segment, and it has pluses and minuses. And because station is basic, basically the lab where we can learn uh, what is the best way to operate, uh, having a variety of uh, technical solutions, uh, we will have more data. And even if we found out that one of the solution is not as good as another, but if we wouldn't try, we wouldn't know about this. So I think uh, uh, having this variety is also good uh, for the station and for the program in general. Mr. Dubé, what are your thoughts on this, on the challenges of design and build and what might be done differently? Yeah, I think the, the, the fact that it's so complex, there's a need probably to have continuous communication between the partners, especially during the de design phases because there, there will be a lot of changes that will impact each other. So uh, we need to better define the interface and well define also the role and responsibilities of every partner. I know like on the ISS program at the beginning during the design phase, we had a couple of changes over time and it, that impacted us on our design for the Canada Arm. And, uh, and it cost a lot of money and also had a big impact also on the schedule. So those need to be defined clearly and also uh, on a regular basis to make sure that at least we could react quickly on those changes. So, uh, Joel Maltabano, do you want to weigh in on this as well? Um, how future uh, projects that might be very complex might have learned from the ISS experience? You know, my biggest advice, and I talk to our gateway folks all the time, is you can't start soon enough talking globally. You got to get out of this 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 idea of you know a single agency item. This has to be a, a global endeavor. It has to be a global partnership. And and the sooner you can start working together, and the sooner you can start sharing, you know, desires, needs, requirements on how you want to operate. To me, the, you you can't start early enough. The, the, it's a huge benefit of the International Space Station. You know, when when we first started. It, you know, we were all kind of getting to know how each other operates, and and you, you can imagine that comes with some different challenges. Um, you know, think of a, of a marriage. You start with a marriage. You, you know, you it's it's you're starting to learn each other. Today we operate, and 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 again, I'm probably a little biased. I believe we operate seamlessly. You know, when we have an issue, we're ready to work together, and we can solve things so much quicker today than we did in the early days. And it's because of what we've done, and you know, with our global partnership. And so, I tell the Gateway guys all the time: start early and and keep pressing in that direction. And specifically, I presume when it comes to design and build, you have to get talking to one another at the design phase early, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, this, this pandemic makes it hard, right? To, for some, for some people and, and it's harder for us, you know, no doubt, but the beauty of space station is because of all the different time zones, uh, we've already been operating remotely. We got a lot of practice in the international space station. So while the, the pandemic has added different challenges, we can't see each other face to face like we, like we need to. And like we, you know, we, we've done in the past, we have some experience on this and we're able to use that. So I'll tell you that while the pandemic's been hard on, on everybody, it could have been a lot harder if we didn't have this partnership already well established. Somebody else want to weigh in on this question of boundaries being pushed out further and further and, and, and how the partnership can help enable some of these very ambitious missions that are now on the drawing boards. Um, Sergey uh, Krikalev, you want to take a stab at that? Uh, Joel already uh, talked about this, that if uh, we work together, uh, all the time we work in, in some limits. We have uh, financial limits, we have uh, work 
uh, resources uh, limitations and uh, working together we can uh, inside the same limits we can uh, move uh, much further uh, combining our efforts we can uh, do more things than we uh, we would be able to do if we uh, walk alone Mr. Dwin, I wanted to ask you this same question about pushing out boundaries and how the ISS lessons uh, can be applied and, and will enable future missions. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's mandatory that in the future, if we want to, to go further, that we will have to cooperate, that we will have to work together. And again, the friendship and the trust, and the, the word trust was used a couple of times, that we have built in this partnership has allowed us, for example, to, to move much faster in the, the way that we have set up the gateway program. But the gateway program is, yes, it's, it's going towards the moon, but at the end, we all want to explore together the surface of the moon. And even later on, we want to go to Mars. And this will be impossible if we don't continue to build this trust, build on the lessons that we have learned from the ISS, and, uh, and yes, work together in ever more complex missions and ever more complex uh, systems because yes the ISS is very complex but imagine that uh, one day we have to fly with uh, uh, six or ten young people uh, to Mars and, and bring them safely back the, the complexity of that today we I don't think that we can even imagine and so we will need all the forces and all the minds bright minds in all the agencies that uh, are there around the world. Uh, Joel Maltambano I'd like to uh, come back to you. You have offered a few thoughts already um, on uh, on what other space agencies might learn from the ISS experience. I'm wondering if you have any additional words of wisdom that you would like to share. Probably the, uh, you know, in addition to what I've said is that my words of wisdom to them would be just get started. Try, you know, you don't have to ha go for the, the biggest, uh, the biggest success right off the bat. Try and fly a payload or two on the International Space Station. See how that works. Try and understand the processes. Allow us to, to show what we can do as a partnership. You know, fly a small payload, then fly a larger payload, then fly a person on board. You know, you see some of the work with UAE, where they, United Arab Emirates, where they flew an, an astronaut on board the International Space Station. So they're, they're taking steps over time. Uh, get in the game is would be my my biggest uh, my next set of wisdom is just get in the game and uh, let us play together. Mr. Sakai, do you have any thoughts on this that you'd like to share with others? Yeah, um, uh, I'm not sure that I, this is the uh, uh, appropriate word, but uh, ISS pro program all allows to stay non ISS partners or participants, astronauts at the ISS, as you know, may as you may know. Los Cosmos has already medi mediated uh, several private astronauts. The crew one launched successfully on November 15th, so I guess the area, uh, the era of a commercial human space flight will open up soon. If the country hesitates, the human space flight not learning human space environment or its difficulties, I recommend to try the. Uh, Onerous, onerous service of ISS utilization to demonstrate the technology for the human space environment. Uh, through the develop, uh, through this de demonstration, they can uh, learn the philosophy of a human space flight and the detailed requirement of human safety. Uh, in the future, a human space activity will expand from the LEO to the moon, but the further, but further we go, the great greater the cost of uh, transportation and communication and the greater the technical risks. It is difficult to carry out a mission in a single country and I believe that the most economical and efficient way to carry out a mission is for the countries to cooperate with each other in a mutually beneficial relationship. I hope a lot of countries develop their own strengths and promote international corporations using their strengths as a contribution. Uh, Mr. Krikalev, do you have any additional words of wisdom you'd like to share with some other space agencies around the world? I would like to say that uh, human space flights is very wide area and um, it's not necessarily to fly uh, personal 
permission to space to to be participant of this uh, human spaceflight exploration because uh, like uh, space or human spaceflight related science it can be life science it can be uh, fundamental physics science it, uh, there is a big variety of uh, activity that can be done by especially new agencies. They can do uh, specific uh, scientific experiment. And in many cases, uh, it can be done on automated uh, spacecraft, on satellites. But uh, in many cases, it's much more efficient actually to do on human space flights. So really, uh, uh, space station is a very good test bed for new uh, experiment, new tests. Uh, preparation for future flights and uh, being participant in this uh, has very different, very many different applications. I want to thank all of you for your comments and reflections on what has been just an incredible International Space Station adventure. Um, I now want to bring back Shelley Brunswick, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Space Foundation, who has a special presentation for all of you. Thank you, Jean, and thank you to all the International Space Station partners for that very inspirational conversation. You make all of us very proud because you show the world what is possible when we all work together to do bold things. And that is why I'm rejoining you in today's program, as it is my privilege to bestow a very special award to each of the ISS partners. It was our hope to present these awards in person to the five partner nations at our annual space symposium this year. But the best laid plans sometimes encounter unforeseen conditions that require us to adapt to new situations. And that is what we are doing today with this virtual ceremony. For over two decades, our Space Achievement Award has recognized individuals or organizations that have demonstrated space achievement, breakthrough space technology, or program or product success representing critical milestones in the evolution of space exploration and development. Its recipients are a who's who of the global space community, and today we add your nation's names to that distinguished list. In the 20 years since the hatch opened and the crew of Expedition One claimed it as our new home, citizens from more than a dozen countries have visited the ISS to live, work, and advance the human adventure and exploration of space. In recognition of their shared leadership, initiative, and investment, the Space Foundation presents its 2020 Space Achievement Award to the five space agencies that have led the ISS program since its inception. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration for the United States of America, Canadian Space Agency for Canada, European Space Agency for its 22 European members, Roscosmos for the Russian Federation, and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency for Japan. On behalf of Space Foundation and the team, I want to congratulate all of these organizations for setting the example of how effective teams work together to benefit all of us. Thank you all and congratulations. Thank you, Shelley. And we'd like to give each of the recipients an opportunity to make a few remarks. Joel Maltobano of NASA, take it away. Well, first of all, let me show the award. It's a uh, it's an honor to receive this award and a huge thank you to the Space Foundation for the award and for recognizing the international partnership. Uh, like we've talked about today, the 20 plus years of operations on the International Space Station have taught the world how to cooperate globally. In my opinion, we've set the standard on how to do that and to be recognized for that is just, it's just outstanding. So on behalf of NASA, and our partners, and I know our partners are gonna get a huge, uh, they'll be able to talk as well. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone. And I promise you we'll continue this great operations of the International Space Station for many years to come. Thank you. And now Frank DeWin of the European Space Agency. Yes, uh, also on behalf of the European Space Agency, uh, thank you very much to the Space Foundation to, to give us this uh, great reward. Uh, but it's a reward, especially for the people, I think. There are thousands of people working every single day seamlessly around the globe together uh, to make sure that six of our citizens can fly safely in space, can operate, can do science, and can work for the benefit of, uh, of humankind. So to all those thousand people in all our agencies, thank you very much on behalf of ESA, and uh, thank you, of course, to the Space Foundation for giving us this great reward. 
Luc Dubé of the Canadian Space Agency. Yeah, so I would like also to thank you for that award. It's a great honor for me to receive it on behalf of the Canadian Space Agency. So I will share it with all the CSC employees who supported this program over these years, and also with the Canadian industry, particularly MDE, who also contribute to the success. So we now uh, control the uh, ISS robots from the ground and continue to evolve with the addition of the autonomous control. So the Canada M2, along also with the shuttle arm, basically build the ISS. So Canada will continue to partner with the other space faring nation and we will continue to evolve. So thank you. Let me give the floor to Junichi Sakai of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. Yeah, thank you very much uh, to uh, uh, Space Symposium. And it is a great honor to receive such a glorious award. And Japan joined the ISS program in the 1980s. In the beginning, Japan has less experience and achievements in human space activity than the US and Russia. And I heard that it was difficult to carry out the program. I have been working on the ISS since 1992, and I am very impressed with the uh, 20th anniversary of human, human mission in the ISS and the various ac accomplishments it, uh, it has pro produced. I hope that this partnership on the ISS will benefit its partners and humanity and that it will continue to grow not only at the ISS but also beyond the ISS. Thank you very much. And Sergei Krikalev of Roscosmos with the Russian Federation. And I would like to continue what uh, Frank already said that uh, uh, this award is uh, uh, a award for a huge number of people working in different countries, uh, working together, and some people is on very uh, some people are on very important positions. Some of them just uh, new engineers and scientists who just recently joined the program, and I think this award belong to all this uh, big crowd that actually uh, built even some something before this uh, um, uh, program started because a lot of uh, things. Uh, NASA inherited from previous uh, program, uh, the same with us, uh, some engineers who develop uh, hardware for Mir station. A lot of this uh, technical solution was adopted for International Space Station. So I think this award belongs to all these people. And I think it's very important for new generation who is just coming to motivate uh, them to see how it was done in previous stages and probably uh, Several years later, a new, new team will receive new award. So thank you all for doing all of this. Congratulations to each of you for receiving the Space Foundation Space Achievement Award. And thank you also for participating in this conversation today. We're grateful to everybody for taking part in this, and we look forward to even more shared adventures living off of planet Earth and a future with even more bold milestones. Thanks so much. And liftoff. Liftoff of the Proton rocket and the Zarya control module. The International Space Station is underway. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour with the first American element of the International Space Station uniting our efforts in space to achieve our common goals. The first two pieces, uh, the Zarya module launching from Kazakhstan and the node uh, Unity from, uh, from the United States, the first time those pieces ever touched each other was you know, 250 miles above the Earth traveling 17,500 miles an hour. They fit together perfectly and the electrical signals across the interface was perfect and yet that was the first time they had ever seen each other.
we all pull together as a partnership, both the United States and Russia, but really also Japan, ESA, and, and Canada all pitch in and help each other through these times. Thank you to our ground support teams. And we really respect your professionalism. When we're up on orbit, we were pretty relieved to have all the risk of launch behind us. But then there was kind of a, uh, a very busy scramble, particularly to find the TV hookup and the TV cable so we could give you that down link. We were really close to the wire, getting that all rigged and happy, and we almost missed it. Go ahead. Have a good day. We finally got access to the internet. We're really happy with it because it helps us feel like we're a little bit more in touch with the world below us. Shall we start taking this symbol of partnership and friendship and competition into space? People who explore, people who venture into the frontier will want to share the experience. It's an amazing experience. We have the internet and we can get the story out to more people. So if we step away and we can look at the Earth from above, we can get a very good feel for all of the dynamic changes that are happening both in the ocean, in the atmosphere, on land, and so forth. This is the cupola. It's one of those places you find yourself hanging out in all the time because all you want to do is look back at our planet. I play this game with myself about where we're flying over the Earth. You can sort of figure it out. You can tell different cloud types over different continents. You can tell different soil types over different continents. Oh wow, the Baja Peninsula. My favorite thing to look at. Nice. Wow, okay. that is amazing. I've definitely drawn encouragement from mentors, and so recognizing that we may be offering that for future space explorers was definitely a privilege and an honor. We have a gift and an opportunity to potentially inspire the future. It's unbelievable that like something that I am doing is going to be like in space. So I'm just like, <laughs> wow. I think this has a really neat potential, you know, something that wasn't available when I was growing up, but where the students themselves can actually participate in what's going on on board station. First we see these pure discoveries where out of the blue you learn something nobody had a clue and it changes the way that a discipline thinks about itself forever. We're studying the long duration effects of spaceflight on humans and on the life support systems that are required to support our life working and living in space. We're most interested in understanding the human body in zero gravity because we want to go beyond a low Earth orbit and explore. Also, we have this applied research that leads us to real Earth benefits where we go out, we seek information, we bring that information back to Earth and directly start impacting people's lives. Today, experiments have been run uh, on boards that have touched over 103 countries around the world. So it's something that the whole world can be proud of.